Aloha, and welcome to Figments, the Power of Imagination, season whatever, episode whatever, I think it's four and five, respectively. It's always good to be with you on Think Tech Hawaii, our amazing nonprofit platform for citizen journalists like me. Um, as you know, maybe, if you don't, Figments is meant to entertain and inspire, and we'll do some of that today, but we've also got something for you to be concerned about. Before that, my opening rant. Here's what has irritated me today. The difficulty of doing things legally and the ease of doing things illegally. So as I get ready for each show, I look for graphics that I can use, and I found some. But the hoops I have to jump through to properly document the copyright the considerations are ridiculous. It's very difficult to do things the right way. And I would add that I have experience in that because if you ever want to try doing something that's really difficult, try legal immigration. My family has relatively recent experience in that. And I don't think there's anything harder in terms of bureaucracy, paperwork, documentation, you name it. But as far as I can tell from the television, it's pretty easy to do it illegally. Now, why is that something that irritates me? Not just because I'm a grumpy old man who wants you to get off my lawn, but because it incentivizes illegal behavior. And in some cases, it's easy to act illegally. We've had three racially motiv motivated uh, shootings recently, Waukesha, Wisconsin, Buffalo, New York, and in California in the last one in November and two in the last two days, all racially motivated, each motivated, each one of those had the, the, the means existed to prevent them. The perpetrators had been identified, but the legal system was too busy making it hard to immigrate or hard to use clip art to prevent these tragedies. That's a bit of hyperbole but not much. Our legal system needs to incentivize good behavior and prevent bad behavior. And right now, it's not doing that. Okay, I don't feel better, but at least I've entered. I feel better because with me today is my good friend and uh, Air Force uh, colleague, Ed Hawkins. Hawk, aloha. Hey, Fig. General Lee, thanks. It's always a Colonel pleasure and an honor. Uh, it's a pleasure, and uh, we play golf together. We've known each other for years. We served in different places in Korea, and uh, Ed and I both have a lot of interest in the Korean Peninsula. I think that's fair to say. Hawk, I hope you agree, because otherwise you're on the wrong show. We're there together, right? Yeah. Yeah, we were, and, and dealing with all the things that seem normal. But we've got something here in, in the last few days, Ed, that I see is not normal. And if you'll uh, permit me, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I call imagining a nation with underlying conditions because of the tragedy of North Korea and what's happening now with the reported explosive outbreak of a fever. They don't call it COVID because the North Korean government has been saying they have no cases. Nobody believed that. But now something extraordinary is happening. And I think it's extraordinary and I think it has consequences that will affect uh, people far beyond the borders of the Hermit Kingdom. So in 2019, I was in Dundong, China. Uh, seeing here on your right, Siniju is to the left. Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea, is about a four, 140 miles by road, if the roads were any good, to the southeast. Um, in, very interesting trip. Made it clear that that border was not sealed. And um, about three or four weeks ago, the Chinese government announced a lockdown of Dandor. And I said to my lovely wife, Alejandra, who sadly isn't watching the show live today because she has other duties, Costco. Um, uh, I said to her, and she'll verify this, not under coercion. I said, there's going to be a major outbreak in North Korea. And I believe that is the source of the outbreak that's happened in the last few days. And here's what's happened. They locked down Dandong um, after 
of course, there were infections with the border open, and they, they had opened the border before the lockdown, so cases could spread. Then there was a major North Korean parade, and if you are North Korean uh, uh, students of North Korea like Ed and I are, you know that that's not, that's not 23 people from the VFW on Main Street. That's a major event, but tens of thousands of people. And they went through a progression announce, of announcements in the last four days. First, we've got our first case of COVID. Okay, that's interesting. Then we have several deaths. Then 200,000, 800,000, and now over a million people either having been treated or being treated. And I think that last count it was 820,000 maybe in some sort of treatment protocol. Hawk, did that surprise you? It surprised me in, in terms of the announcement. Yeah, because uh, they're, they're, they've been so secretive, you know, about, uh, I, I think it's nobody really thought that they didn't have any, but this uh, huge uh, announcement of the huge outbreak uh, so quickly, and it, it seems to be true. You know, it seems to be true. They're treating it like true. And uh, I think that has implications on, you know, what, what North Korea, Kim, and his people will do from now on. And I think that's part of what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, it, it is. So the, the, the admission, more than the presence of the disease, is what shocked me. What, what, what do you think could drive Kim Jong-un to drop the veil and say, we have a Houston or Wonsan, we have a problem? What would motivate him to do that? Well, I'm thinking several reasons. First is uh, when you have small outbreaks, you could probably hide it. Mm -hmm. But when it gets to a million or so, there's no way, absolutely no way you could find, uh, hide it. So the people know. And one of the major things that Kim and the leadership need, even though it's a totalitarian government, is support of the population. Mm -hmm. And it may be a way to, one, to acknowledge, second, to show care for the people, you know, that here's the great leader, or the the leader, the great leader, the dear leader, yeah. the uh, whatever leader, whatever he's called now, um, yeah. is caring for the people. And then the the third thing that I saw, because uh, Kim reached out and blamed the the cabinet and mm -hmm. the, uh, military, the health sector, I think, yeah. that looking for a scapegoat, you know, somebody to blame, and that's because he can't be blamed. Right? Yeah, so, so let me interrupt to correct myself and say that he didn't blame the military, but he has, quote, mobilized the yeah. military to... He has not blamed the military. ...to do whatever, and right. to me, it, it almost looks like a purge is coming, because in Korea, in North Korea, um, there aren't many second chances, yeah. and if if you are, in fact, held accountable for allowing... Well, perhaps, this pandemic, perhaps, yeah. big, the logical... Um, argument from that point, once they've acknowledged, once he's trying to find scapegoats, that it may be, although I'm, I'm not too, uh, I'm not too clear on this one, is maybe it's a way to reach out for outside help. You know, this and gives, that's, it, yeah, that's what you see in most of the, the this gives, Western media. It oh. gives cause for him to reach out to outside help. Now that but he could have home. done that anyway. And I mean, he didn't need to. He didn't need to admit a million plus right. infections to say, "Hey, we need some help." And it's not the North Korean way. They were offered vaccines from the Chinese and others, and through the United Nations Covax program. And what did they say to that offer? Colonel they refused Hawkins? it. Yeah, they did. Yeah. And the reason was, you know, we know what the reason is that he didn't want outside monitoring. You know, that's one of the things. They're such a close society mm -hmm. that uh, uh, any kind of outside help like that, and that's uh, and that's one of the things that I think we need to consider is that uh, he has not requested it yet, right? Outside help, even yeah. though Yun has uh, the new president of South Korea has offered. Yeah. Um, he may, but I think that's one of the things that we should consider. You know, what happens if he does not? And there's a very good likelihood that he may not ask for now. So um, there's so much to talk about here, Ed. I think we're going to run out of time, even though we've, we've just started. Um, 
but President Yoon, who's a week or so into his term in office, have a nice day, here's your first big problem. He's more conservative than his predecessor, largely seen as a hardliner on North Korea. But if anything about all of this encourages me, it's that he has said, hey, we will help if we can. And from a humanitarian, from a human sense, that's the right thing to say. So I'm encouraged by that. But how do you help North Korea? I mean, send vaccines, too late. Send medicines, what medicines are they? So what, what, can, what could that help be is another question. In terms of regime legitimacy, the population is suffering and has been suffering for, for, for decades. Uh, maybe the announcement is justification for further crackdown. I, boy, I don't know. It's hard to come up with a truly plausible explanation. But then again, we don't have Kim Jong-un's perspective. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the consequences, because when I heard this, and when, uh, even three weeks ago when Dan Dong was locked down, my vision, and I'm probably wrong, I can't predict baseball playoffs or anything else, have been right about some COVID predictions, but I could see millions of um, people dying, North Korean people dying. Uh, what do you think? Well, it depends on uh, the actions. And uh, from what we've seen so far, um, you know, uh, Kim and the regime has not even called it COVID yet. They're saying uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's a, a fever. A fever. Yeah, fever and some complications that's hospitalized. And um, they're beginning to a uh, quarantine. That's the only thing that they've, they've offered as, as a, as a uh, uh, option. Uh, and then the other thing is blaming. How's that working? Sector. Pardon me while I interrupt a second. How's that working in China? Not so well, but go ahead. <laughs> right, right, right. So they're they're following the Chinese. I think they're going to follow the Chinese example at least for the short term. But but the other the other point is that um, Kim has uh, blamed the health sector and getting medication out to the people. You know, he has said that we need to get medication. Now, medication is palliative. They're just, you know, like cold medicine and things like that. What he needs is remdesivir or something like that to fight yeah. it. And also testing, right? Those are the two things that, that you need. And I think the assessment right now is that North Korea has very little of this. So and that's not even emphasized, but that's so what they need to fight this. It, and I'm very uh, pessimistic yet about, about even that helping much because if you have a massive infection in a chronically malnourished population, then the testing is kind of irrelevant. I don't know, you know if, if this is centered in Pyongyang, it is difficult to get around North Korea. Maybe there's not enough um, uh, transit uh, internally to spread it, but the flip side of that, the dark flip side of that, is even if you get medicines, uh, any kind of anything that will uh, assist the population, how do you get it around North Korea? Back when I was a deputy commander, U.S. Pacific Command, one day I went into the intelligence assessment, and our intelligence folks like you reported that a North Korean coal ship had sunk between Japan and the southeastern side of it. South Korea, and I, what's a North Korean coal ship doing there? Where is it going? And the answer is, it was going from the West Coast to the East Coast because the roads are too bad. The internal infrastructure, and this is back in 2006 or seven, was too bad to put it on a truck or a train car and send it across. And that's happened at least a couple times since, I think as recently as 2000. Uh, 19. So their ships aren't very good, but their infrastructure is even worse. So let's say the world gets together and instead of spending $40 billion firing, uh, fueling the death and destruction of Ukraine, and I do want Russia to lose, but I'm concerned about the focus of our assistance. Um, 
let's say the world does get together and puts together a, a humanitarian medical assistance package, you can't get it anywhere in North Korea. And that's what that's what makes me think that the the very negative outcome, millions of deaths, could be inevitable. I don't want to feel that way, but it could. So let's take a quick break here from that sunny prophecy. We'll come back and Ed and I'll talk more about what what can we do if we can't do that. Um, and some other possible consequences to tell you that I have no idea a month from today what the next show will be about because there's so much stuff going on in the world. So imagine, just imagine what figments the power of imagination will be. I'll be back on June 13th after a break for Memorial Day. Uh, same bat time, same bat channel. And hopefully I'll have some good news because we haven't been really um, awash in good news from them, or it recently rather. So, Hawk, one of the many things I worry about in terms of the uh, outcome is what does this do to the regime? Could you, know, you and I have watched people or heard people predict a collapse of the North Korean regime for decades, since, since the mid-90s. Could this be it? Could this be the straw that broke the Kim dynasty's back? Well, we've uh, for decades we've said it's right around the corner. <laughs> you and know, you've got nine lives, right? Yeah, and, and probably more. So I I'd be hesitant to say this is it, but this is going to going to tax them. You know, um, I think mobilization of the military. Uh, I think that addresses what the concern that you raised about getting uh -huh. you know anything out to. That's the only infrastructure they have to to get. Uh, anything out to the hinterlands, you know, the military, uh, they, they can probably address that. Um, but it's, I, I don't think you could say, you know, I, I, I think we've been wrong so many times before mm -hmm. uh, that they're going to collapse, but uh, this is going to try them. And I think this acknowledgement uh, is, is the first step, I think, in trying to deal with this somehow. And an interesting point that was made by in a, one of the Korean Central News Agency reports, KCNA, the government uh, news outlet, was that the most of the deaths, and who knows how many they've got, more than 20 at this point, use, your, use the multiply function on your calculator, um, were people using the wrong drugs in response. So... I've read a lot about the North Korean experience. That's what makes me so interested in it. And the psychology of fear that permeates the repressed society. And you and I both lived in Korea, me for four years and you for a couple. And you can picture this isolated, hungry, panicked population trying home remedies that do in fact kill them. And they're more vulnerable to that doing that. And so if if Kim is trying to stave off panic and he does it with the military, but the military gets sick too, there's a lot of instability and um, dictators do not have absolute power. So like you, I know that we've all been wrong before. I very inaccurately predicted the demise of the North Korean regime. It was going to happen in 1998. I was certain of it, and it didn't. But uh, with the impact on the population and on the on the military, um, this could be it. If that happens, what do we have to worry about? Ed? I mean, so what? Yay! North Korea is done. The regime is gone. Woohoo! South Korea can just take over. Everything's gone. Yeah, right? we've we've never experienced where the leader uh, loses legitimacy in the north, and yeah. uh, what that may portend. Um, there are probably sectors, you know, some people, groups that um, know the real situation, you know, day to day, that that may be able to step in, but we don't know that. The only the, yeah. the party in the military is where the power is. And, I don't uh, think I've told this story on on Figments, but let me share. I had a friend who worked for the United 
have a friend. He worked for the United Nations in North Korea. Great guy. Um, and uh, when he was in North Korea, he, his family stayed in New Zealand. And uh, he traveled to see his family what, during the Ebola outbreak. And he, this guy was a senior enough guy that the North Koreans watched him at a fairly senior level, his handler, his, his interlocutor who kept an eye on him. And uh, he came back from home leave went into Pyongyang and had a very strict three-week lockdown for Ebola in North Korea. And that made him mad. And he's the kind of guy, you just see him getting grumpy about it. My kind of guy. And so once he's out of uh, house arrest and gets a chance to talk to his counterpart, a relatively senior North Korean, he starts complaining about this unnecessary quarantine and the north korean relatively senior official says to him oh you you, you have to understand so and so you were in new zealand o over two thousand people died or over ten thousand people died in new zealand from a bowl and it's up to a million in japan now think about that how complete is the isolation from the truth that lets a, a North Korean official think that Ebola is killing tens of thousands, millions of people in Asia. So who knows? Who knows? Well, right now he's clearly in charge. And yeah, uh, he's in charge. Yeah. But yeah, but, but how big is the epiphany going to be, Ed? Uh, you know, you're look, let's say you're a mid-level North Korean official mm -hmm. running uh, Hamong something, and as far as you know, the COVID program has worked perfectly. And the next thing you see, lots of people are sick and dying. What does that do to your loyalty to the government? Can you even put yourself in North Korean shoes? Well, the, the regime, Kim included, you know, they not cared much about people dying. Um, Ever. They've let people starve, you know, the famines that they had mm -hmm. in the past, millions of people, right, possibly die yeah, so yep. it could get to that position and still be legitimate i i think it it all depends on what he does you know i i think the first step is uh they're good at quarantine you know uh totalitarian states of yeah, that's their life china for example so i suspect that that's what will he will try first uh but if that doesn't control it then i think that's where you know the unknowns come in What's, what's going to happen when that doesn't work? And I think one way to look at what they, how they might do, and he may use that to reach out to the outside. We talked about help, you know, asking yeah. for help, which is very difficult, difficult for the North Koreans to do. But I think one of the things that we should take a look at is the uh, emergence. We haven't heard much from the bad cop, you know, Kim's sister. Uh, uh, yeah. Jung. So he's if, so nice. Yeah, so if if we hear something from the bad cop, it may portend that they're going to hunker down. Uh, if not, then maybe they'll ask for outside help, and uh, maybe that will alleviate some of the problems. That's uh, boy, that's really interesting, Ed. I think you're you're onto something about the if if the lovely sister um, who is, as you said, the bad cop comes out, that'll indicate the direction that they're taking uh but but i i don't see china responding too much do you because i think they've got their own problems i think china's you know well, you said, lockdown you said in the Shang, vaccine, shanghai you know, and elsewhere yeah right right and and uh, there's only their only solution uh the uh example they can offer is the quarantine which yeah. what they're doing and so, it's too so late like it's, for the sinovac and the others that they may have got some of that, but so, uh, it's there is a major impediment to population. to quarantine as well. Sorry to talk over yet, mm -hmm. but I know we're getting close to the end. But um, yes, totalitarian totalitarian states are pretty good at that. Um, but rural North Korea is far different than uh, metropolitan Shanghai, A, and B. Given the current food shortage, which is one in a long list of uh, of food shortages, 
starvation is going to be an issue. And if you have a choice between food or the virus, you're going to take food and accept the virus. So uh, to me, that portends potential unrest. Um, in my mind, uh, there is very little we can do, but here's my proposal. I can I please shoot uh, holes in it after I give it. It goes back to my time at Paycom. In late 2007, North Korea is faced with very significant flooding and um, very significant flooding. And uh, there are many populations isolated and potentially starving in an already starving nation. And my proposal to the senior leaders in the US was to do a humanitarian rations airdrop to it and, um, and offer to the then uh, Kim Jong il regime no conditions, no American flags on the packages. We had done humanitarian rations drops in Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere. We're pretty good at it. But there were starving people, and we could feed them. And I thought it would, A, do the right thing, and B, change the paradigm of discussion between the two countries. I, um, I think something like that could be an approach for the United States. And I'd remind you, we're spending $40 billion on fueling destruction in Ukraine. I want Ukraine to win. But just I don't, want, I don't want war to be our preferred mode. Why not provide a mixed um, airlift and airdrop? Because, uh, again, you can't distribute once you get to the major airfields. Uh, two various parts of North Korea that our intelligence experts say need, need the help most, food and medicine. Now, somebody in the National Security Council, when I proposed this back in 2007, said, well, Fig, what if, what if North Korea refuses? I said, I said well, then they, they prove themselves guilty of crimes against humanity. But so what if they refuse? You, know, you mean you fight your way in? I said, well, we fight our way into kill people? Why don't we fight our way into feed people? In this case, why don't we do whatever is necessary to provide some kind of relief? We can offer it if accepted. Great. If not, take some risks. Because this is a huge, potentially a huge humanitarian disaster that will create instability. And we haven't even talked about this, Ed, a nuclear armed nation. Imagine a collapse of nukes. What do you think of that? Good or bad? Colonel Hawkins, over to you. Well, um, I think you got to consider the other side of, of your uh, proposal, and that is, will the United States and the American public support that? You know, that, that is the key. Yeah. And right now, you know, with North Korea supporting Russia uh, against Ukraine and, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the narrative of, of Russia uh, launching missiles, developing uh, nuclear weapons, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if this administration in this year of the midterms, plus Congress and the American people, would support something like that. That's not yeah, a I'm given. Not sure, I'm not sure they would either, but uh, that's not a given, I, Dick. I don't have to care. I'm, in fact, I'm pretty sure they wouldn't. That's not a political statement. But um, so we, you know, there's a tendency right now to, and lightly to invest in failure rather than success. We could change the paradigm and assist a suffering population. Um, luckily, I'm not a politician, so I don't have to get support for it. And this will be an interesting situation to watch for the next few weeks. I pray for the best uh, for North Korea, the people of North Korea, not the government, um, but also the world. Because if there is instability, if there is collapse, if there are nuclear weapons, this could be much worse than a simple expansion of the pandemic. So thanks for sharing your thoughts with me, as always, Hawk. Thanks, Meg. We will see you on the golf course where you <laughs> will take my money again. In the meantime, folks, if you would, please check out the playlists for both this show, Figments, the Power of Imagination, and the former Figments on Reality, which was more commentary. And remember that our friends at Think Tech Hawaii make this possible. They're a wonderful uh, nonprofit, just like I'm a nonprofit kind of guy in this endeavor. And I invite you to join in their uh, spring fund drive 
and keep their work possible. So with that, aloha. See you in a month. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.